Well, now that we're all woken up, <laughs> if you had actually turned your Bibles to Daniel, that feels a little bit different today. Uh, turn your Bibles with me to Daniel chapter 2. We'll actually be looking at 1 Peter, but I want to start in Daniel for a purpose here. This morning, now I had the opportunity to teach for about 11 years now, and I, I love teaching. Um, Austin North actually has a record, though, in terms of uh, my students. He is the student with the best excuses I've ever heard to miss class. <clears throat> One day he texted me, right on the, I'm, I'm heading to class, he's supposed to be there at 8 o'clock, and he says, uh, Dr. Miller, I'm not going to make it today because someone stole, and what do you think is going to follow? His steering wheel. No joke at all. And of course, he sent me a picture because he knew I wouldn't believe him. <laughs> uh, but apparently, whatever car he has, the steering wheel, the, uh, the airbag is worth quite a bit. So uh, somebody has stolen his, his steering wheel. He couldn't make it to, to school that day. And then uh, just a number of days back, he texted me and said, Dr. Miller, just to let you know, I won't be in class tomorrow because someone hit me with a vehicle. And I'm thinking, huh, what happened? So I texted him right away. He had sent an email to him. I texted him right away and said, hey, you know, what happened? Well, his, his phone was destroyed, and so he didn't get my text. But I was able to visit with him the next day. And, uh, and uh, man, what, what a faithful guy, though. I'm so grateful for Austin and for his placement here among you. And I'm grateful for God's protection of him. I'm grateful today also for the opportunity to preach the word, and so here we are in Daniel chapter 2. Now, the reason that uh, we're turning to Daniel chapter 2 is because it talks about a rock here. And if you were here last week, you remember that we began discussing Peter's passage, Peter's passage in chapter 2, verses 4 to 10, where he talks about the rock that is Jesus. And so we're going to be looking at Jesus, the rock here, and you'll notice that I've labeled the title for this, uh, this sermon, A Kingdom Founded on the Rock. A Kingdom Founded on the Rock. Now, are you familiar or are you aware that it's election season? Did you know that? <laughs> somehow, somehow somebody clued you into that. One of the things I don't understand, there's some, some official in Wisconsin who keeps sending me stuff to vote for him. I live in Michigan now. I, I don't understand how they keep sending me things, but I can't vote for this guy. Uh, I probably would vote for him, but I can't. But we see all the advertisements, and uh, there, there are really two kinds of advertisements that you can find out there. There's the negative advertisements and the positive ones. And the negative tend to go something like this. Hey, listen, if you vote for this person, can you imagine how horrible life is going to be? The world's just going to be the worst place ever if you vote for this person. So, so if you want this nation to prosper, if you want this nation to thrive, then you certainly don't, don't want this person in position. Of course, the opposite side is, suggests that, in fact, there are some people that you do want in office, because if they're in office, then everything will go well. Well, the reason I bring all this up is because the scriptural text also tells us that there's going to come one who's going to take a political office and is going to change the landscape of our entire world. Amen. Would you look with me in Daniel chapter 2? And we want, to look, we want to begin in verse 31. I can't do justice to Daniel because our preaching text today is the book of 1 Peter. But I want to give you context for one of the things I think Peter's doing in 1 Peter. He never quotes directly from Daniel. But if you were a Jew in the first century, you knew this passage. You knew this text. And I think if you heard about a stone that was going to be established, you thought of this passage. So let's read the passage here. <clears throat> we'll begin in verse 31. <clears throat> you saw, O king, by the way, let me just build a little bit of the context. Daniel is standing before the king. The king has said, all the wise men, somebody needs to come and tell me my dream and then tell me the interpretation of it. And all the wise men kept saying things like, well, once you tell us the dream, we'll tell you the interpretation of it. And the king says, I will have none of that. If you can actually tell me the interpretation, then you can tell me the dream first. And Daniel comes along, and he, in fact, can do this. 
And so this is what he says in verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. The image, mighty and exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its metal and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Now, I I want you... To imagine again, verse 34, you look, a stone was cut by no human hand. It is cut by divine hand, and it comes from heaven. Verse 35, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold, the entirety of the structure, the entire image, all together were broken in pieces and became like the shaft of the summer threshing floors. So finely grinded were they that they were like shaft. And the wind carried them away, never to be seen again, so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, in terms of the, uh, the, the place there in Babylon, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given whatever, or it, it, wherever they dwell, and the children of man, the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, making you rule over all of them, you are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and the toes, partly of the potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdoms be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. Now, again, I mentioned that I cannot do justice to the Daniel passage. Indeed, reading that passage may bring up more questions in your mind than answers as you think about, well, who was the gold? Who was the bronze? Who were the, the, the clay? And, and we could discuss all that, but this isn't a passage on Daniel. Simply, I want you to understand that this is a passage well known within the heart of, of God's people who are awaiting the Messiah. People like the ones reading First Peter who have come to know their Old Testament. And when Peter says, in 1 Peter chapter 2, and you can turn there if you would now, when Peter says this, as you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men in the sight of God, chosen and precious. One of the things they can't help but think about is the fact that this one, this stone, this living stone on whom God is... Uh, through whom God is establishing a new work, is in fact the stone cut out from heaven. The stone that comes not by human hands, but by divine hands, and is now set for the placement of a new kingdom. I began by noting that our world tells us that in fact we need a reinvigoration, we need a reestablishment, a new sort of a kingdom that's going to come. And here's what the scripture says. That everybody knows that that's what we need. We need renovation. We need change. Because this world is quite the disappointment as it stands. But there is coming one day 
a king who will establish a kingdom on this earth. But here's what 1 Peter chapter 2 tells us, that the one who will one day come and crush these kingdoms has in fact already come. He has not only already come, but he has already come and he has begun in small pockets a work which resembles the very kingdom of God. Do you know what the church is? The church is outposts of the kingdom. We are outposts of the kingdom. Nowhere in scripture does it tell us that we are to bring in the kingdom of God. God's going to bring in his kingdom when he brings in his kingdom. But it does say this, when you are among the saints of God, when you are in the, in the church of God, this is to be an image of what the kingdom is going to be like. And I am the first, and you all know this, I'm the first to admit that so often our microcosms of the kingdom fall short of what the kingdom will be like. But they give us a taste. They give us a taste. And have you not among God's people tasted the glory of the age to come. I think all of us have to say yes to that. Among God's people, we do sense that. And this is what Peter is telling us. So what does this have to, all this have to do with 1 Peter chapter 2? I would say this, we're looking particularly at verses 7 to 10, but I want to look at a couple of, uh, of the previous verses as well. And I want to just establish a couple of points and to walk you through what I think Peter is attempting to tell us here today. And the first is this, Jesus is the rock on which God is building a whole new world. Jesus is the rock upon which God is building a whole new world. Now, why would I say that? Partly because of the passage we just read. Daniel says that there's going to come this stone from heaven that's going to establish a new king distinct from the kingdoms of this world, but it will replace all of them. It will crush all of them. None of them will survive, but this one will last an eternity. This is God's kingdom to come. But there's also hints within the passages Peter uses that he's referring to this same kingdom. You remember Isaiah 28, 16, in which the Septuagint, the Septuagintal translation says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will lay for the foundations of Zion, the foundations of my holy mount. I'm going to lay a precious choice stone, a cornerstone. Now, if you hear someone say, I'm going to lay a cornerstone, what are they telling you? They're telling you they're going to build a new building. You don't set a cornerstone after you've done all the other stones. You set a cornerstone when you're building something new. And what Peter's telling us here is he's quoting Isaiah and what Isaiah is saying. God has said to Isaiah, I am going to build something new. There's going to be a new temple. And of course, Jesus is going to flesh this out. The new temple is going to be based upon his ministry, his life and death. It's going to be based on who he is. Isaiah then indicates that there is coming a choice, precious stone. And it's going to be a cornerstone for the foundation. And whoever believes in this one, oh, he will never be put to shame. Another passage, Psalm 117, 22, we remember again this one from last week. The stone the builders rejected has nevertheless become the cornerstone. And here's what Psalms was telling us, and here's what we have to remember today. God made promises to the people of Israel. The people of Israel would be the recipients of many of those promises, one of which would be that an earthly kingdom would be established for their benefit. And God has not abandoned that promise. It will come to pass in the future. Just read Romans 9 to 11. But one of the things the Bible tells us too is that despite these promises, these builders, the ones who should be actively involved in the work of establishing God's kingdom with him because they are his chosen people, have nevertheless rejected the very cornerstone he has, he has sent to them. You could read about this in the gospel passages, particularly Matthew, develops exactly how it is that Jesus came to be the Messiah, to be the stone for these people. And yet, they rejected him. So, what was God to do? What would he do if his very chosen people would reject him? Would he then abandon his plans? Psalms ingrained even in the Old Testament that he was never going to abandon his plan to establish a new kingdom. Instead, 
Even though the builders have rejected him, nevertheless, the cornerstone has in fact been established. Acts 4.11 then clarifies and reveals to us, you say, is Jesus really this cornerstone? Notice, here's the preaching of Peter. This Jesus, whom you crucified, he's saying, is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has nevertheless become the cornerstone. One of the things we realize about God's program is this, that despite what men do, God will establish his kingdom. And if men reject him, God is going to establish his kingdom. And if men accept him, God is going to establish his kingdom. So if in fact Jesus is the rock, on which God is building a whole new world, then the next question we have to ask is this, or the next point in in understanding what Peter is saying is this, if in fact Jesus is the rock on which God is building a whole new world, the second thing you have to understand is your future depends on how you relate to this rock. Your future relates on how you relate to this rock. Now, why do I say that? It comes straight from the Old Testament passages. Isaiah 28. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will lay for this foundations in Zion a precious stone. And then notice at the end, the one who believes in him. So the one who responds positively and trusts in this stone, he will never be put to shame. You know what that passage is talking about? It's saying he'll never be disappointed. See, because that's what causes shame. You believe in something, you trust in something, but you're disappointed. And he says, you'll never, ever be put to shame. Isaiah 8, 14 is much more clear here, though. If you trust in him, he'll become your holy precinct. And you will not encounter him as a stumbling caused by a stone, nor as a fall caused by a rock. Now, I'm excited. Next week, uh, Garrett, Pastor Garrett's going to be working through this passage from what I understand. Am I right in saying that? Oh, you're doing 28. All right. So he's doing the other stone passage. Uh, and, and I'm excited to see what he has to say on that. Isaiah 8 here says, now look, depending on how you relate to Jesus will depend on how he relates to you. He's the same stone, but how you relate to him differs. I think actually this makes a lot of sense to us, doesn't it? Just think in in regular life, there are times where you're at the beach and you see a huge wave. And for you, because you're out swimming, what's your view of that wave? Uh, You you don't quite like it because it's about to crush you and may may in fact crush you. On the other hand, somebody a, a little further down, he's surfing. What does he think about that wave? It's the best thing he's ever experienced. It's the same wave, isn't it? Same wave, experienced differently by by different people because of the way they're approaching the wave. The same sun that we go out and see so little of this time of year and into the winter. Often you'll find me in my office whenever I'm studying Uh, sitting directly next to the window where the sun comes in so that it hits me, so that I get a little bit of vitamin D. I need it in the midst of these winters. The same sun that provides vitamin D and such sustenance for us is also the same sun if you fall asleep in the middle of the summer laying, you're going to wake up perhaps even with second degree burns. It's the same sun. In some circumstances provides life, some circumstances provides death, depends on how you relate to this sun. The same fire that can heat the cold room can also destroy the entire house. You see, one of the things we understand about the way that we relate to this rock is depending on how you relate to it determines how it relates to you. Would you allow me one more illustration from the Chronicles of Narnia? (laughs) I love the Chronicles of Narnia. One of, the, one of the first times the children hear about Aslan the lion, who is a representation of Jesus in the story, 
It says this, a curious thing happened when they heard the name of Aslan. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. But the moment the beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite differently. Perhaps it sometimes happened to you in a dream that someone says something which you don't understand, but in the dream it feels like it had some enormous meaning. Either a terrifying one, which turns the whole dream into a nightmare, or else a lovely meaning, too lovely to put into words, which makes the dream so beautiful that you remember it your whole life and are always wishing you could get into that dream again. It was like that now. At the name of Aslan, each one of the children felt something jump in its inside. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror. If you're familiar with the story, Edmund is about to betray them to the, to, to the White Witch. And he, when he hears the name of Aslan, he experiences, even in his own heart, a horror. Peter, however, which is his brother, suddenly felt brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by her. Lucy got the feeling you have when you wake up in the morning and realize that it's the beginning of the holidays or the beginning of summer. All of these illustrations by C.S. Lewis tell us this, that the, that the same individual spoken of brings to the heart different experiences for different people because they're approaching him in a different way. And in the same way, the same rock on which God is going to be building a new world, it depends on how you relate to him, how you will experience him. So, how should we and how might we experience this divine stone cut out from the heavenly places that it will come and establish a new kingdom. I think there's a couple of different ways we can experience this rock. First, we can experience him positively as a shelter. One of the things that uh, I mentioned uh, last week even uh, was my wife and I, I had the opportunity to, to go to Israel. And one of the things that uh, you do when you go to Israel is you go into the southern portion of Israel and you see all of these caves that are in the rocks. Now, they're not caves in the rock because people carve the cave, caves in the rock, but they're just naturally formed caves in the rock. And when they go into these caves, what they find is that there are lots of evidence of human habitation. People would frequently live in or visit frequently these caves. Why is that? Well, it's quite evident, isn't it? Because if you're in the middle of the winter, or I'm sorry, if you're in the middle of the, the desert, and it's the high noon portion of the day, do you want to be outside? Uh, even, even today, many parts of the world that are extremely warm have siestas or times in which you just don't do work in the afternoon. You have to find some sort of shelter. Where are you going to find shelter in the middle of the desert? The place you find shelter are the rocks in which you can go in and find shelter and security. In fact, the Old Testament uses language like this about Jesus or about the Lord. Psalm 18.2 the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. I can hide in him. He, he gives me protection. He's my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Psalm 31, 2, similar concept. Incline your ear to me. Come quickly to rescue me. Be the rock of my refuge, Lord. Psalm 71, 3, be my rock of refuge. You see, one of the things that I think is ingrained in this idea that Jesus is a rock is that he is a shelter in which we can hide, find security. He is the one that will never change. But there's a second way in which we can experience him. We can positively experience him as a foundation. This is closer to what Peter is explicitly indicating here because he says that Jesus is the foundation stone upon which God is building a new world, a new, a new building, a new plan. And so one way we can experience this stone is as a foundation, the rock on which you can build your life. You know, there's so much that shifts in this world. So much that yesterday to today is completely different. But there's one thing 
that the scriptures say is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes. The Lord Jesus never changes. He is a foundation upon which if you trust in his word, you'll never be disappointed. You can't be because he doesn't change. No human relationship can ever provide you full security. We would love that, wouldn't we? We'd love to fully trust. We'd love to to say, we know that this person would never, ever deceive us. He would never lie. She would never uh, do the wrong thing. And yet, so often, we fail each other and we're failed by one another, even even as believers. But you know, there's one who will never fail you. He has never failed anyone. He will never fail anyone. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word is steadfast. It is a foundation upon which you can trust. If you find a word that he's given to you in this text, you say, that's my word. He's promised it to me. And I believe it. He is a foundation upon which we can build our lives upon. Indeed, Jesus says this at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Do you remember these words? Jesus has just proclaimed the most incredible sermon that anyone's ever heard. And he comes to the end of this sermon and he says this, Therefore, every one of you who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, And the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But you see, there's another way. And we're about to get to this in just a moment. Because we can can come to this rock as a foundation upon which we build our lives. Or we can ignore what this rock has said. And this is what Jesus says. But there are others. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. You know what Jesus is saying in this text? He's saying, you can build your life on my words. They will never fail you. But if you ignore my words, then your life will be a sham. Your life will be built on the foundation that cannot survive. Maybe we might put it this way as we think back to Daniel chapter 2. You're putting your trust in the kingdoms of this world. The statue. You might even be putting your trust in the golden portion of the statue, which seems impenetrable. It cannot fail. And yet when the stone that comes from heaven comes, what does it do even to the golden portion of the statue? Crushes Crushes them. Such that there's such fine powder that the wind blows and it's done away. Very similar to the message Jesus gives here. Build your life on these things. Build your life with these precious metals, if you will. But it will not last. You have a choice. How will you build your life? You see, positively, we should establish that Jesus is the one in which we can find refuge. Jesus is the one through whom we may build our lives upon because he is building a new world. He has been established as the stone. But there's another way to come to this Jesus. And this comes straight from the book of Isaiah. You may experience this stone as a stumbling stone. As a stumbling stone, this comes directly from Isaiah where he says you can experience him as a stone of stumbling. Or looking in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says this in verse 8. We'll start in verse 7. So to you there is honor for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and, notice the next line, a stone of stumbling. And a rock of offense. A stone of stumbling. And a rock of offense. What does it mean to stumble over the stone? 
Remember a moment ago I said that Jesus is the stone in which God is establishing a new world. And yet your experience of this stone will depend upon how you approach him. If you approach him, trusting in him, then he will be for you a shelter. He will be for you a foundation upon which you can build your life. But if you do not approach him that way, then he will be the one you stumble over. I have a friend right now, and our, our conversations are quite frustrating. He had at one time embraced Christ, it seemed. And in our recent conversations, what he wants to say is, I fully believe in God. I trust in God. God is true. There's so much evidence for God that I can't say no to God. But I just don't know about Jesus. I just don't know about Jesus. Oh, friend, I, I, I struggle extremely with that idea, idea. It is completely irrational. You, you can't come to God and say, I want you, but I don't want Jesus. Jesus is essential to God. It's like, it's like saying, I want a Jackson Pollock painting. Have you ever seen Jackson Pollock paintings? He's the guy who you think just threw paint against the wall and, and, and then people pay a million dollars for this, this painting. And you say, I'd like a Jackson Pollock painting, but could I get one that's a little more organized? You say, well, what do you mean? That's the whole point. His art is this way. Or if you say, you know, we just made a trade for Stephen Curry uh, from the Golden State Warriors. And so now he's on our team. But we'd really like him to stop shooting three-pointers. Instead, what we'd like him to do is to drive to the basket every time. If you're familiar with basketball, you know that Stephen is the best three-point shooter in the history of the NBA. And you're saying, we want Stephen Curry, but we don't want Stephen Curry. Because this is who Stephen Curry is. He's the three-point shooter. Or it's like uh, just recently, I, uh, this, uh, this afternoon or this evening, uh, we're going over to Andrew Van Houten's house for pizza. And he texted me and he asked, what do you like on your pizza? And I responded that I would like a pizza with a zucchini crust. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> if I could have, instead of uh, pizza sauce, avocado spread... And uh, no cheese, please. And, and I texted that, and then I started getting a little bit nervous, and I thought, oh, no. What if he doesn't think I'm joking? <laughs> but he was dead on. He knew exactly what I was talking about because he said, okay, well, I'll just give you some of the communion crackers, <laughs> which I thought was a good response. Uh, but that's not a pizza, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want to call that, that may be edible in some sense, but it's not a pizza. You've, you've taken everything that's a pizza out of it. And when somebody comes to me and they say, I want God, but I don't want Jesus, I say, then you don't want God. Because Jesus is the essence of who God is. You see, some stumble over Jesus. But this is God's plan. This is, from the foundation of the world, what is the Old Testament? It is the it is God's movement to restore our fellowship with him. This is what was lost in the garden. And how will we be restored to fellowship with him? Here's what the scriptures teach. God is establishing a stone who will make us holy, who will bring us into his kingdom. And when we are in that kingdom, we'll have relation with God once more. And if you reject this stone, then you have rejected God. Amen. You see, some experience Jesus as a stumbling stone, but I think there's a danger in this passage because you'll notice he doesn't just say a stone of stumbling, but then he says some experience in this way is not only a stone of stumbling, but a rock of offense. Or, as some other translations put it, a stone that causes you to fall. I think there's an advancement in the language of the passage here. And there's a danger that the Apostle Peter is warning us about, and it's this. That there are some, perhaps even in this room today, you've heard the, the, the teachings of the gospel. You've heard that Jesus is the cornerstone upon which God is establishing a new world. And as you approach him, you're not accepting him. And you've stumbled a bit. But here's what the scriptures say. He can be a stone of stumbling and he can be a rock that causes you to sin or it causes you to fall catastrophically. 
And there is a danger today. If you have been rejecting God's stone, there comes a time when people reject him for the very last time. Hebrews tells us, there's a warning in the book of Hebrews. It goes this way in chapter 4. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter the rest. Here's his glorious point. Some will enter God's rest. They will enter the kingdom. They will enter the thing for which God has been establishing. Some will enter that rest. And since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them, they heard the message of the gospel. They did not go in because of their disobedience. Because of this. Because there is a rest we can enter. And because some in the past heard the good news and did not enter into, here's what God says to us. God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did a long time Later, he spoke through the day, through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. I don't know the state of the heart of all of those who sit in the hearing of my voice. God has brought you here today. And you have heard that Jesus is the stone upon which God is establishing a whole new work. A whole new world. And if you trust in him, if you believe in him, if you hear his words and you build your life on him, all will be well. But if you do not, there is catastrophic fall in your future. Everything will be crushed and wiped away. There is no future there. And the book of Hebrews says this. God has established a day. Every one of us will have our last chance. Sometime. I'm not telling you today is your last chance. I don't know when your last chance might be. But if you've not trusted in him, today could be your last chance to trust in him. So it's called today. And if you hear his voice, if you hear him now, respond to him. Because Jesus is the rock upon which God is building a whole new world. And our experience of this rock will depend upon how we come to him. We can experience him as a shelter. We can experience him as a foundation. Or we can experience him as one who causes us to stumble. Or as one who causes us to ultimately fall. There's one last point I want to say then. What do we do then? What do we do? How must we approach the stone if in fact the way we approach him determines our future destiny? Whether we enjoy the kingdom he's establishing or whether we were rejected from it, what must we do? Notice the language of the passage. Notice verse 7. So the honor, because those who believe in the, in the stone, he says back in verse number 6, it stands in scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and pre precious. And whoever believes in him, whoever trusts in him will never be put to shame. So honor is for you who, note the next word, believe. Amen. Indeed, this is what he says. What must we do? We must trust in him. Peter goes on in verse 8. Jesus is a stone of stumbling. He is a rock of offense. And then he tells us, and don't miss this. He tells us why it is that some will stumble and fall at the stone and others won't. Why is it that as we experience life, some come to Jesus and ultimately trip over him and fall and are catastrophically destroyed? Why is it that others come to this stone and they kneel before it and they become with him living stones built into this kingdom that God is establishing? What is the difference between these two? Peter tells us here. It's because the first, those who believe in him, or th those who uh, are, embrace him, they believe, they trust in him. But you notice verse 8, the stone is stumbling and a rock of offense. Here's why they stumble. They stumble... Because they disobey the word. Now you say, what does the word have to do with anything? I thought we were talking about Jesus. 
And yet, have you not seen how the scriptures portray Jesus as the word? Jesus' word is the word of God. He has come from heaven to reveal to us what God's plan is. This is why Jesus could say at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, listen, if you hear my words and you listen to them and you follow them, then your life will be built on the rock. Do you realize how incredible those words are? Could you imagine me coming up to you today and saying, listen, if you listen to the words I say and you build your life on my words, then you're, then you're building your life on the rock. But if you don't listen to me, well, then you're building your life on the, on the sand. And you should expect to be destroyed one day. What would you say to me? you say, who are you? And do you know what? That's exactly what the people in Matthew chapter 7 asked. Because this is exactly what it says right after he finishes speaking. It says the people were amazed. And they asked, who speaks with such authority? He speaks with an authority that our scribes and Pharisees don't speak with. He did. Do you remember what he said in Matthew chapter 5? He didn't say, thus saith the Lord. What did he say? I say, I say to you. Because he's the stone. Because his words determine our eternal destiny. And here's what the scriptures teach then. They stumble over this stone because they disobey God's word. So, we come to the point of decision. And I hope, I trust, that the majority of you in this room have already decided to bow the knee to this stone. Because it's inevitable. In one sense, whether you believe in this stone or not, doesn't matter to the way in which the world is going to continue because God is going to establish this stone and his kingdom is going to be established on it. But in the other sense, it makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference in the world. Now, Peter goes on to say, they stumble because they disobeyed the word. And then he says, as they were destined to do. I want to make mention of that because I I don't want to skip over anything the scriptures teach. He says, they stumble because they disobeyed the word and they were destined to do this. It's not clear what Peter is saying here. There are two options and I'll just give them to you. Some believe what Peter's saying is they stumble and they were destined to stumble because anyone who disobeys the word will stumble. So what God destines for people is whoever will not obey the word will stumble over the word. Others interpret this as that in fact God has established that he has chosen some for salvation and he's allowed the others to go on into stumbling. The thing we must not walk away with though is the conception that it doesn't matter what you do in this moment right now. Because here's what the scriptures teach. Whatever your view of election, whatever your view of of exactly how to put together the, the, the tension between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, here's what the scriptures command every one of us to do today. To believe in the Son. And here's the promise. If you will believe in Him, then you will establish your life on this rock. And you, along with every other believer, notice these words, will never be disappointed. You will never be put to shame. And so, my friends, I ask you, have you trusted in this stone? Have you obeyed the word of God? And if you've not, could I implore you today? Because this could be today, the day, the last day in which you may respond to God's gracious provision of life. He holds it before you. And what must we do? We trust him. Oh, so backwards for what we think. We think, what what must I do? Tell me the 10-step process. And he says, here's what you do. Believe in me, and I'll do the rest. Oh, friend, believe in him. Father, I pray today for the souls that sit before me, those who are saints of yours, who have trusted in your son, who have bowed the knee to this rock, Jesus, for whom you have established, who you will build the entirety of life upon. I pray 
that they today would continue to submit to your stone, Jesus. But I especially pray for those who sit within the hearing of my voice. Your spirit is at work in their hearts. They're hearing my voice now, but they're hearing your voice ultimately. And you are saying to them, trust my son, believe, and I will be to you also a shelter. I will be to you also a foundation upon which you may build your life. Well, friend, today, if you heard God's voice today, oh, please respond. Oh, Father, would you help those who hear to respond in faith? Thank you, Father, for your grace, gracious provision of this stone. Thank you for the hope that lies ahead because we know that since you have established this stone, you will fulfill your word, fulfill your promises to establish a kingdom in which we will all be in. Oh Lord, none of your saints will ever be disappointed. We will never experience shame and we thank you for it.